Hello, you beautiful people. Today we're coming at you guys with some fantasy sleepers that can help you guys win your drafts. As we all know, the season's starting soon. You're going to need to make your drafts probably in this week or the next week. And I'm just going to go ahead and give you some guys that I think their average draft position or their ADP is way too low for where I think they're going to finish at the end of the year. So, for example, if a guy's projected to finish as like the 100th ranked player and I think he's going to finish as like the 60th ranked player, then that would classify as a sleeper and that would be someone that I'd put on this list. So yeah, I hope that makes sense. These are more going to help you guys with your late round picks. And yeah, we'll just go ahead and get right into it. As I'm sure you geniuses probably put together from the thumbnail, the first player that I want to talk about and the biggest sleeper that I'm considering in like an ESPN's rankings and draft order and everything is going to be Kevin Porter Jr. So if we look at Kevin Porter Jr.'s average draft position right now, he's being drafted around 118th. And that is just way too low for Kevin Porter Jr. I am insanely high on him. I'm honestly expecting him to finish as like a top 60 player this year. I know that sounds like a bit of a stretch, but just hear me out. Last season, as soon as John Wall went down, he averaged 20.9 points per game, 6.1 assists, and three field goals, three three pointers per game. Sorry, and th there was a lot of hesitancy because Jalen Green's coming in. Maybe he's not going to get a lot of ball handling, but I'm pretty confident that Kevin Porter Jr. is going to be running the one guard for the Rockets. He's a really good ball handler, really good isolation player, really good at like setting up his teammates. Used a lot of really goods there, as you can tell, very descriptive uh, speaking as usual on the channel. But yeah, I'm expecting a lot of good pick and rolls with him and Christian Wood. Porter's going to have the ball in his hands most of the time. He's a score first player that is capable of filling it up from the assists. And yeah, overall, I just expect a really good season out of him. He's going to be getting like 32 minutes a game. Primary ball handler on a bad team, so he's going to have a lot of like leeway and green light in terms of shot making, shot taking, I should say. And yeah, that's why I'm just expecting a really good season out of Kevin Porter Jr. And I think if you can snag him for like your last pick in like a 10-team or an 8-team draft, like for, for me personally, like in, in my 8-team draft, I'm probably looking at drafting him around 90th because I think people are just criminally underrating him and I think I can snag him there. If people start becoming more aware of him because he is showing out in the preseason right now and his draft position starts going up, you might have to take him a little bit earlier than that. But we'll just sort of have to adjust as things go. But yeah, for right now, I'm pretty confident in Kevin Porter Jr., I don't think you have to take him 60th necessarily because I think you will be able to get him later than that. But if you have a pick in like the mid 80s to like low 90s, I think that's a great place to snag Kevin Porter Jr. I think he's going to have an absolutely insane year and I think it's someone that will really help you win your fantasy draft. Next up is going to be OG Ananobi of the Toronto Raptors. OG is another player that I'm expecting to take a big leap this season, especially because of the way the Raptors are looking as, as so far as like their roster is currently constructed. I mean, Fred VanVleet's obviously the go-to number one guy. Siakam is out for at least another month, I believe, so OG is going to be like the number two option on the team in terms of scoring, and I, I'm expecting that to sort of translate to him having to create more of his own offense off the dribble look for his own shot. We saw in the first preseason game, don't want to read too much into it, but he was sort of taking guys off the dribble more than he was in the previous season. And yeah, right now he's being drafted around 80. His draft average draft position is 80.1. I feel like that's a little too low for OG. I'm expecting him to honestly have like a top 50 fantasy season, especially when you consider the positional scarcity in point guard, or sorry, in small forwards. Fuck, can't speak English today. But yeah, if you look at, there's an article by Andre Snellings that I'll link in the description, but he sort of made like a tier list of every single position, and small forward is honestly sort of lacking, like the quality in small forward after OG and Anobi really starts to like teeter off. I mean, then there's Buddy Heald, Andrew Wiggins, Jeremy Grant, RJ Barrett, and I feel like OJ and an OG and Anobi is a noticeable upgrade from those guys in terms of fantasy production, and then once you get past that tier 6, which are like maybe passable guys, on to tier 7 and below it's just guys that aren't really that great for fantasy purposes so yeah that's why i'm really high on og and anobi it's fact that he's playing a small forward and he can play the power forward position as well the raptors depth at the front court isn't really as deep as you'd think it might be i mean there's right at the moment there's og scotty barnes birch and boucher og's clearly the best player offensively out of those plus with his contributions in the defensive categories for like those periphery stats always love to have those in fantasy and yeah, I think OG just really going to take a big leap in his production this year. He did get hurt last year. He had a calf injury. I'm not too particularly worried about it. He hasn't had a long history of injuries. And yeah, if he's going to increase his three-point numbers, more ball handling opportunities. He's going to give you probably like a steal and a half a game, average around 20 points per game. Overall, really solid player, really solid 3 and D guy. For category leagues, I think he'll help you out a lot there as well. If you want like some defensive stats and a few steals, you can probably snag OG. But mostly for like points leagues, I really think his production is going to take a big leap this season, and I would definitely recommend taking him around like, you can probably snag him honestly around like the 65th pick, 
I think that would be a really great place to take OG. That's sort of where I'm eyeing him at. Because of right now, he's being drafted around 80th. That's just a little bit too too low for my liking. So I would try to take him probably in like the late 50s, early 60s. And that should probably save you around like 20 spots of value. And could really help you move up in your draft. If you really nail your late round picks, you're more apt to have a really good shot of winning your league. You really kind of have to like not fuck up your early ones. Because like if you screw up an early pick, you're not going to win your league. You don't really have a shot. But once you get those picks, you can be a little bit riskier, be a little bit more strategic, play at like what positions you need to fill. And yeah, that's why I think OG, due to all these reasons, I think he's a really great fantasy option and I would highly recommend picking him if you have like a 65th pick roughly and you don't know who else to take, I think I would lean towards OG. So next up is one that I really don't understand why he's being drafted so low, but it's going to be Jonas Valanciunas. His average draft position at the time I'm recording this is around 104th. I'm expecting Jonas Valanciunas to have, like, at the very minimum, a top 70 season. So if you can snag Jonas Valanciunas at anywhere around the 70th pick, I think you're getting an absolute steal. You're making, like, 20, 30 spots of value up. And really, for, like, late-round picks, I don't know why ESPN's thing is glitching. Like, they have him projected to score around 2,400 points this year, but he's ranked, like, 115th, which doesn't really make any sense. It's probably just a glitch or something. But, hey, you can take advantage of that in your draft if people aren't too aware of what's going on or they're not too dialed in or like aware of the circumstances surrounding all of the players. Jonas Valanciunas is a very sneaky pickup. I'm probably going to target him around 70th if I'm in a points league and it's my pick and I need a center. I'm sort of planning my draft around like grabbing Jonas late. Like he's someone that I really think is going to have a lot of value late on in drafts. So if I can sort of take care of my other positions, there you can always grab like a decent center at some point, but I feel like it's really important to take care of like your small forward, power forward, and your guards early on in your draft. So it really just opens up Jonas Valanciunas sort of saves me a lot of trouble. Gives me an opportunity to grab a really solid player late in the rounds. And yeah, I don't know why they're expecting his points to go down so much. He's playing with Zion and Brandon Ingram now, but I honestly think it's going to translate to roughly a, a, like the same output that he was putting up in Memphis. He's still going to have a lot of rebounds to grab. He's the best rebounder on their team by far. He's still going to get a lot of paint touches, and he can spread the floor a little bit for Zion, so... Maybe we'll even get a few open looks. Maybe his three-point numbers will increase. Obviously, they're not going to like skyrocket or anything crazy like that. But yeah, I do think Jonas is going to have a very similar season to last season in terms of his production. And he has had a few seasons with injuries. He's had a few without. But honestly, if you're taking him with like the 70th pick, I'm perfectly comfortable taking that risk because the risk to reward ratio with like what you could, what Jonas Valanciunas could be versus like what might happen, I think it's definitely worth it. And anything that can make up value like that in your draft is really just going to take you to the top of your league and really help you win it all. So yeah, Jonas Valanciunas is going to be the third sleeper on the list. So next up we have Keldon Johnson. And Keldon Johnson's average draft position right now is around 111th. And I think at worst case scenario, he's going to have like a 95th best player in the league for fantasy purposes season. I feel like he's like, if we look at the Spurs roster, it's really barren right now. Like DeJounte Murray is the go-to guy, number one option. And then probably Derek White's the number two, but he's always been dealing with injuries the past few seasons, is not reliable at all. And then honestly, it's probably going to be Keldon Johnson as the third option on a team. And like that's subject to change, he'll probably get a lot of shots. He's going to get like 30 minutes per game. And I feel like someone that's getting 30 minutes per game, young player, very explosive. He was, has some flashes last year, but he was interrupted because of the Rona and everything. But yeah, I just feel like that's all of those factors put in. I think that he's going to have a really good season. He'll probably average around like 18 points per game or something. And I just feel like that's great value to have if you have like a late round pick in like the 90s. Might as well go ahead and snag Keldon Johnson. I feel like there's not really a whole lot of downside and I feel like just for like a team like the Spurs which doesn't have a lot of options, you really just sort of have to like find a diamond in the rough there and it'll give you like some fringe fantasy production. Nothing crazy, like I don't think he's going to crack top 70 or anything like that. But yeah, I'm really expecting him to have like a pretty okay season. Definitely a step up from last year and I think he's definitely worth taking a look at. So yeah, Keldon Johnson coming in as the fourth sleeper on the list. And then lastly, for my guys in deeper leagues, I'm going to go ahead and give you two players that I think could outperform their ADPs by quite a significant margin. It's going to be Jordan Poole and Malik Beasley. And the one I'm more confident in outperforming is going to be Jordan Poole. I actually had this video planned before he went off in the preseason, but if we look at the Warriors roster, they're really desperate for guys that are going to like take the pressure off of Steph Curry. And it's not like they have a lot of options in terms of people that can do that right now. Clay isn't going to be back to like December or January, and even then, like he's not going to be playing back to backs. Probably there's going to be minutes restrictions. There's just going to be a lot of annoying shit you're going to have to deal with. And I think honestly, if you can take Jordan Poole instead, I think that's a great option. He's probably going to be like the number two to number three scoring option. He's going to get a lot of looks, a lot of minutes. I assume if he keeps up this preseason tra trajectory, he's probably going to sneak his way into the starting lineup. 
which is kind of crazy to say. But yeah, we saw some flashes last season. He had a 38-point game against New Orleans and really sort of saw like what kind of production he could put up given the opportunity and the minutes. Obviously, I don't think he's going to average 38 points per game. But yeah, his average draft position right now is 139. I think he could easily sneak into like the top 100 players, top 110 players for sure. And yeah, if you can make up 20 spots of value like that late in the draft, I think that's a really massive W that you can't really over, over like overlook. You know what I mean? So yeah, Jordan Poole could be a really solid option. I definitely watch how the rest of the preseason plays out. Maybe that'll affect your decision. Maybe it won't. But yeah, if I'm in a deeper league, I'm definitely looking at making sure Jordan Poole is someone that I draft. And then next up, Malik Beasley. He's a bit of a riskier one. I think the main thing with Malik Beasley is people are sort of underestimating the like impact he's going to have on Anthony Edwards' numbers. I think they're probably going to hinder each other's scoring a little bit because they're very similar players. They both are like score first, look to shoot whenever they can. But yeah, Malik Beasley's average draft season is around 127. I could see him maybe sneaking into like the top 110, so not like a huge jump, but never know he's capable he's like a prolific scorer guys like that like they're capable of filling it up some games obviously obviously everyone's aware of like the suspension looking over last season and everything he had an injury as well but if you're drafting around the 110 120 area i say you might as well take a chance on malik beasley he has a, a lot of upside and if it's downside you can always just drop him and pick up someone from waivers so yeah that's going to wrap up the video thank you guys very much for watching my rankings official rankings are going to be coming out hopefully on friday i'm going to have to try to have it be like a top 50 or a top 75 total players and then depending on like the how you guys are feeling about it maybe i'll do like a top 100 added like 25 more players to that but yeah thank you guys very much for watching don't forget to subscribe we're trying to hit a thousand subscribers by the end of the year that'd be really awesome really appreciate that and yeah, thank you guys again for watching, and as always, I hope you guys all have a great rest of your day.